In this presentation, we're going to be focusing on the bay issue of habitat loss. So the Galveston Bay system has lost 8,000 plus acres of saltwater wetlands and 80,000 plus acres of freshwater wetlands. And this is only in the past 20 years. Um, so let's just take a time to look at this reflective quote by Aldo Leopold. To those devoid of imagination, a blank place on a map is a useless waste. But to others, it's the most valuable part. So let's take a step back and understand what habitat means. It's a common term used in wildlife management and it refers to four components, food, water, shelter, and space. Um, if we look specifically uh, at Texas habitats, there are 13 different ecoregions. And right here in the, um, the lime green is the Blackland Prairie. And if you actually click on this map made by the Audubon Society, you can go ahead and zoom through all of these different ecosystems. So cross timbers and the light brown and uh, Edwards Plateau and the purple. But let's jump back to our presentation. So to understand what makes a healthy habitat, we need to know what biodiversity means. Oh. Our planet's diverse, thriving ecosystems may seem like permanent fixtures, but they're actually vulnerable to collapse. Jungles can become deserts, and reefs can become lifeless rocks, even without cataclysmic events like volcanoes and asteroids. What makes one ecosystem strong and another weak in the face of change? The answer, to a large extent, is biodiversity. Biodiversity is built out of three intertwined features, ecosystem diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity. The more intertwining there is between these features, the denser and more resilient the weave becomes. Take the Amazon rainforest. One so what this video is getting at is that in order to have a healthy habitat, you can't just grow one plant or have one animal. You really need to have, um, you know, a full range of organisms. So now let's um, break down what some of the different causes of habitat losses are. So first off, we have population growth. As our population grows, more and more land is converted for human needs. So more than half of America's wetlands that support waterfowl and wildlife have been drained or plowed. Um, and specifically, if we look at Texas, um, we currently have over 25 million residents with 82% of those living in urban areas. Uh, and you can visualize this by looking at the map above. So the population of Texas is predicted to reach 40 million residents by the year 2050. And the biggest threat within this um, is the breakup of large land tracts into smaller tracts. So this division of ownership and associated change in land use is referred to as land fragmentation. When we think about issues animals face, we think about climate change, the increasing human population, and deforestation. But habitat fragmentation is one of the longest lasting pressures these animals face. Habitat fragmentation, as the name describes, is the breaking up of an area of land habituated by a population of animals. Habitat fragmentation is caused by two things, humans and natural events, the former making up a larger percentage of the causes behind this problem. Within these two categories, research has shown three different types of habitat fragmentation. Those are habitat isolation, habitat degradation, and habitat subdivision. Although all three of them encompass the same problem, we'll show you the difference with this current example. Koalas, the cuddly Australian marsupials, have been heavily impacted by habitat fragmentation for thousands of years. In the Northern Hemisphere, continental ice sheets have split up and restricted species to only a few small populations during the glacial cycles. In the Southern Hemisphere, 
biogeographical barriers such as the Brisbane Valley Barrier, Hunter Valley Barrier, and the Clarence River Barrier have restricted gene flow and movement, creating bottlenecked populations. These are examples of natural habitat fragmentation. However, agriculture, urbanization, forest fires, drought, and climate change are all human-caused movements. Consequently, koala habitats become smaller and more fragmented, also known as habitat isolation. Subdivision leads to further isolation of species from one another if the habitats are separated by a significant distance. This makes it harder for sexual reproduction, which leads to inbreeding and reduced genetic diversity, an issue koalas are currently facing. These marsupials are more likely to move through developed areas, having to cross dangerous roads or pass through properties where they can get attacked by dogs or drown in backyard swimming pools. In Southeast Queensland, over 100 koalas are hospitalized each year after being attacked by dogs, and 75% of these will die from their injuries. Consequently, habitat fragmentation results in a decline in numbers and possible extinction. Simple solutions to this problem can be through more education to the public so they are aware of the effects of destruction of habitats and reconstruction and conservation of habitats by building roads around a specific habitat or replanting destroyed areas. A more complex solution may be wildlife crossings, which is effectively a bridge for animals to cross over highways, such as they've done in the Netherlands. Alternatively, wildlife corridors can be used to go under motorways. Both solutions allow for broken habitats to be connected and allow species a safe way to cross this dangerous barrier. Through universal efforts, we can prevent further habitat fragmentation and reverse as many effects as possible. So this plot shows the monthly mean sea level rise um, and it's taking out the regular seasonal fluctuations due to coastal ocean temperatures, salinities, winds, atmospheric pressures, and ocean currents. So let's watch this video to understand sea level rise a bit more. Coastal living in the Gulf of Mexico is filled with rich culture, beautiful shorelines with incredible views, and salt water at the heart of our communities. But living here, starting point of water depth. Waves and tides affect our perception of sea level, but are not included when measuring it over long periods of time. All along the Gulf, tide stations and satellites measure and track the sea level. It's these very measurements that show us that our seas are rising. Simply put, sea level rise is the increase in water level with two primary causes. The first is melting land ice, and the second is seawater taking up more space as it warms. Sea level rise isn't new. As the earth warms and cools, sea levels move up and down. But decades of observations tell us that we are warming and that our seas are getting higher. The earth's ice will continue to melt and at a faster pace. Every coastal community will experience sea level rise differently though. In the northern Gulf of Mexico, the coast has a very low and gradual slope, leaving little natural barrier for the increasing seas. As a result, small increases in sea level have more noticeable impacts and more significant consequences. Additionally, in some areas of the Gulf, the land is sinking. This comes from both natural and man-made causes like sediment compaction, pulling oil and natural gas from underground, and overpumping of groundwater for activities including irrigation or industrial or municipal water use. As the land sinks, the impact of rising waters increases, meaning coastal defenses and buildings designed to weather today's storms will not protect us in the future. Because every community will experience... All right, so this next part of the video is getting into... ...the level rise differently. Well, Scientists use multiple using models to look at sea level rise. So we're going to see Texas A&M at Corpus, Corpus Cripsy has actually made um, a map specifically for Galveston Bay. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. And if you zoom through this main part, all right. Here's where we get to the start. So you first need to choose a baseline to compare to the future to. So they chose 2017 because that happened to be the most recent year they had complete data. 
So if you look at this key here, you can see the color which correlates to the different type of ecosystem. And then the pie chart will tell you what percent of land um, is made up by that ecosystem. So now if we scroll down, it'll have sliders that'll show you how land is gonna convert. So on the left here, this is um, the current, which remember we decided was 2007. And then on the right is uh, 2100. And at that point, there'll be 2.43 feet of sea level rise. So if we look at our key here, the teal green color is salt marsh and the pink is tidal flats. So let's say we move it all to current day, 27, 2007. Um, it's really just mainly salt marshes, but then uh, after that 2.43 feet of sea level rise, we can see a lot of pink zones with tidal flats. So if you uh, come onto this website, uh, you'll be able to see this transition for a lot of different ecosystems. So let's jump back to the presentation. Another cause of uh, habitat degradation is actually invasive species. Massive vines that blanket the southern United States, climbing as high as 100 feet as they uproot trees and swallow buildings. A ravenous snake that is capable of devouring an alligator. Rabbit populations that eat themselves into starvation. These aren't horror movie concepts, they're real stories. But how could such situations exist in nature? All three are examples of invasive species. Organisms harmful not because of what they are, but where they happen to be. The kudzu vine, for example, had grown quietly in its native East Asia, eaten by various insects and dying off during the cold winters. But its fortunes changed when it was imported into the southeastern United States for porch decoration and cattle feed. Its planting was even subsidized by the government to fight soil erosion. With sunny fields, a mild climate, and no natural predators in its new home, the vine grew uncontrollably until it became known as the plant that ate the South. So you remember how we were talking about biodiversity. Um, if you have an invasive species coming over and dominating that habitat, it um, is going to get rid of that really important biodiversity. So now we're going to look at a specific species that has been impacted by habitat loss in Texas. There's tons of tribes. We've been trapping birds at Candelaria, Texas. There's one right there. The birds they are after are Gamble's quail, a species found across the desert southwest. Once you get into New Mexico and Arizona, the species becomes much more common, but in our state, it's very limited. The goal is to reestablish these birds further east, where they were once also found. While Gamble's have fared better than some, every quail species in the state has lost some ground. There are four species of quail in Texas, the Montezuma quail, the Gamble's quail, the scale quail, also called the blue quail, and the bobwhite. Certainly the most popular and well-known species is the bobwhite quail. But the iconic bobwhite is in trouble. Over the past 20, 30 years, we've seen serious declines across its entire range, including Texas. Fundamentally, conservationists agree that the root cause is changes in the quality and quantity of habitat. So now let's look at some success stories in restoring land uh, in Galveston Bay. So this is Pierce Marsh, and this is located near Hitchcock, Texas. It's a preserved owned in part by the Galveston Bay Foundation and the Nature Conservancy. So they, um, by 2016, uh, have restored approximately 80 acres of salt marsh complex 
and they hope to continue to restore about 200 acres of marsh habitat at this site. This is Burnett Bay back in 1944. It was bounded by really extensive wetlands, um, but in 1995, the area had experienced five to eight feet of elevation loss due to subsidence, which caused the wetlands to disappear um, along with the native vegetation and wildlife. So through this project, the Galveston Bay Foundation restored 33 acres of intertidal marsh complex um, by using dredge material to raise the elevations and support the regrowth of wetland vegetation. All right, so did you know that one oyster actually filters 50 gallons of water a day by helping to remove unwanted pollutants? However, oysters and their habitats are really threatened by increasingly powerful storms. So 60% of oyster habitat was lost in Hurricane Ike. They're also threatened by overharvesting and pollution. Um, and you know, unlike most sea creatures, they don't just live in the water. They specifically need to live in other oyster shells. So the Galveston Bay Foundation has started their oyster shell recycling program, and they partner with some of these different restaurants. Um, and what those restaurants do is, rather than um, getting rid of their shucked oyster shells, they actually return them to the bay to create oyster habitat. So it may sound kind of strange, but oysters actually can be gardened. So Galveston Bay Foundation works with bayfront property owners interested in becoming oyster gardeners to improve the health of Galveston Bay. So every spring, they train volunteers in part of the participating communities to create and maintain oyster gardens using recycled oyster shells. Uh, they also do large scale oyster restoration. So for this, the Galveston Bay Foundation works with partners to place culch materials such as river rock or limestone on the bay bottom, and then they'll place recycled oyster shells on top to provide the ideal habitat for native bay oysters. So this is kind of hard to visualize without actually seeing it. Water's worth of damage in its wake. And the oysters in the bay were lost. In East Bay, 80% were destroyed. It's here where efforts to restore the reefs are underway. We are in East Bay. We're actually between Bolivar Peninsula and Smith Point up in that area. After Hurricane Ike, there was a whole sediment layer and mud layer that was just put on uh, all these reefs out here. And so by bringing back some material, then hopefully then we can get it back to the way it once was. Tons of river rock will serve as the foundation for the restoration of this reef. We are measuring uh, the culch material, which is this river rock material that's going to go into the bay. This is very good substrate for when oysters, when they spawn and their larva will attach to this. Uh, this we found is a very good material for that. And um, what we're doing right now is we're measuring to see exactly the width and the height and um, the length of all of this material. We put it into a formula to find out exactly how much cubic yards of culture material they have here on this barge. We measure each barge to make sure that we have the right amount of culture material out in the bay that we had asked for. We're putting down about 20 acres out on this side. Each barge load is about two acres. So this, what you see right here is two acres of material put down. We put it down about five inches of material on the bay bottom. With a little help from surviving reefs in the vicinity, the restored reef will rebound quickly. What it will do is each oyster can release thousands upon thousands of larvae into the, into the bay. They're free swimming. They'll come on over and then when they find a good hard substrate, that's when. All right. So lastly today, we're gonna take a look at some art inspiration surrounding habitat loss. Um, so first we have some student work. This is Bethany Holt and she did a double exposure uh, showing several marine organisms whose habitat is threatened by the expansion of the world population. And lastly, we have this art book produced by Expedition Art. So they're currently working with 51 different artists from eight different countries, and they've created this portrait of 97 unique animals who are facing extinction from habitat loss. So each animal portrayed in the book has a detailed description, interesting facts, um, and just thoughts from the artists. 
So an idea for this is that you could make a book of artwork of all of the animals facing threat from habitat loss in Galveston Bay. Oh, my God.